Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. Now we're going to continue our reading and discussion of the book, A Woman Rides a Beast by Dave Hunt. Yesterday we uh, concluded our, uh, concluded in the midst of our discussion of the donation of Constantine in a portion of this chapter entitled Rome Equals Vatican. Look, um, God left us no excuse for not recognizing who our Messiah is. There's no mistake. The Bible describes Jesus Christ, even the words he would say while being crucified on the cross. That he would be born of a virgin. That his lineage would be found all the way back to David. The, the, I couldn't enumerate all of the specific references in the Bible that, that could apply to no one else but Jesus. We're to know who our Savior is. And God left no excuse to be deceived about who Jesus was, who he is today. And the question must be asked, why would God leave us oblivious as to who his counterfeit is, the Antichrist. Why would God deal so treacherously with his people to even leave the potential for us to be deceived about who the Antichrist is? Who would deceive the whole Christian world? Who would enslave us? Who would attempt to replace Christ in the world. The fact of the matter is, he left no doubt who his antichrist is. He went to as great a pains to identify antichrist as he did to identify Jesus Christ himself in the Bible. It's in black and white. We have no excuse not to know who is the man of sin, the son of perdition? The one who exalts himself above any god. It's the Pope of Rome, and Dave Hunt is proving it. He's systematically going through Revelation chapter 17. Just that particular chapter alone leaves no excuse for God's people not to know who it is. Stop and ask yourself the question. Meditate upon this question. If God wants us to know most assuredly who our Savior is, why would a just and merciful God, one who would come down from heaven, take upon himself the body of a man, live a sinless life, and redeem us by his own blood, and then leave us oblivious about who would deceive us and deprive us of that salvation? I cannot believe, I cannot believe that any sincere believer in God would doubt that God went to just as much trouble to identify Christ's counterfeit as he did to identify his own son. Most Christians today, if you ask them, who is the Antichrist? You get a million different answers. For as many Christians as you ask, who is the Antichrist? You'll get that many different answers. Isn't that amazing? And the most ridiculous answer of all is, we're not supposed to know who the Antichrist is. And that's the one I hear the most. Absolutely absurd. If you listen careful to Dave Hunt in this book, he will leave you no doubt 
who the Antichrist is. Despite his futurist error, Dave Hunt knows who the Antichrist is. And he's showing us right here in his book. Now, I'm going to back up a little bit for continuity purposes. I'm going to begin in the first, uh, the last full paragraph on page 72, if you're following along in your own copy of the book. He says, the Pope's authority even extended to large territories outside Rome, acquired in the 8th century. At that time, with the help of a deliberately fraudulent document, a forgery manufactured for the popes known as the Donation of Constantine, Pope Stephen III convinced King Pepin, King of the Franks, and a father of Charlemagne, that territories recently taken by the Lombards from the Byzantines actually had been given to the papacy by the Emperor Constantine. Pepin routed the Lombards and handed to the Pope the keys of some 20 cities, and a huge chunk of land joined them, uh, joining them along the Adriatic coast. Okay, these became known as the Papal States. The Pope ruled like a tyrant over them. This is when the Pope became a temporal king. And, of course, the justification for this kingly status and this territory over which he ruled came, supposedly, from the donation of Constantine, which is universally accepted now as a, as a, as a diabolical forgery. The entire basis of the Pope's claim as King of Kings is based on a forgery, an admitted forgery, called the Donation of Constantine. Now, dated the 30th of March of 315 A.D., the Donation of Constantine declared that Constantine, Emperor Constantine, had given these lands along with Rome and the Lateran Palace, to the popes in perpetuity. In 1440, this document was proved to be a forgery by Lorenzo Valla, a papal aid, and is so recognized by historians today. Okay, no doubt about it. Everybody accepts the donation of Constantine was a forgery. And there's very little quibbling over the fact that the so-called pseudo-Isidorian decretals, the false decretals of the popes, a like fraudulent document and simply manufactured out of thin air by the papacy, which manufactures a line of popes filling in the empty space in history whereby Rome had no record of, of the earliest popes in an attempt to prove that the papacy is the successor of the Apostle Peter. They simply manufactured it. And all of it was designed to prove the divine right of the Pope to rule spiritually and temporally. But mostly it grew it cultivated the legal authority of the Pope to be a king of kings. The king of kings. These documents together, both known fraudgeries, the donation of Constantine and the pseudo-Isidorian decretals, are still the foundation of this blasphemous institution known today as the papacy. The most powerful man on the planet. It says, in 1440, this document, the donation of Constantine, was proven to be a forgery by Lorenzo Valla, a papal aide, and is still recognized by historians today. Yet, allegedly infallible popes continued for centuries to assert that the donation of Constantine was genuine, and on that basis to justify their pomp, power, and possessions. Did you know that it is... <clears throat> extrapolated from the donation of Constantine that the Pope 
has divine right legal ownership of all the earth. All the earth and the sea and the air and everything, including the airwaves, including the Internet. It's the basis of the belief that the Pope claims that the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. Dave Hunt says that fraud is still perpetrated by an inscription in the baptistry of Rome's St. John Lateran Church, which has never been corrected. Oh, they don't intend to correct anything. It's... And, and this is only one example. This inscription. The Pope still maintains the title Pontifex Maximus, Supreme Pontiff. That he gets from the donation of Constantine. The papal fraud is still being perpetrated upon the world. Where's the outcry? Why, why can't we discuss this thing? Why isn't it talked about in the mainstream media? Why is it when (coughs) Roman Catholic priests, Jesuits, Roman Catholic prelates stroll through the halls of Congress and the White House and the Supreme Court, why aren't they met with hissing? They have no real authority in the world. God has openly exposed them to the whole world leaving no one any doubt that they are simply the representatives of what the Bible calls the Antichrist, the man of sin. Why are they not met with hissing wherever they go? Thus the papal states were literally stolen by the popes from their rightful owners. See, The Pope is the man of sin. He's not bound by the law of God. Theft, according to the papacy, is his divine right. Institutionally, the Vatican violates all ten of God's commandments. Institutionally, as a matter of its faith, the central teaching of the Roman Catholic Church demands that the Pope has the right to steal. And he literally stole the Papal States on the authority of a forgery. There you have lying and theft. Forgeries are lies. The Papal States were stolen. Lie upon lie theft upon theft, sin upon sin. Rome compounds sin. That's her business. He says, thus the papal states were literally stolen from the, uh, by the popes from their rightful owners. The papacy controlled and taxed these territories. Rome just loves to tax. Do you know that 60% of your taxes go straight to the Vatican? Or you say, Tom, that's outrageous. No, that's what Karen Hudis says. The World Bank whistleblower. Karen Hudis. Now, I'm not touting Karen Hudis as the end-all and be-all of truth-tellers. I think she's got an agenda, and her agenda is the Constitutional Congress. Her ultimate goal is to overthrow the Constitution of the United States. That's what her ultimate goal is. She, ultimately, she's working for the Vatican, but... She's leading us into that trap by revealing some really serious truths. Sixty percent of our taxes go to Rome, just like those taxes of the papal state. Nothing's changed. The papacy controlled and taxed these territories. You might say the papacy controls and taxes the United States today, just like he taxed the papal states back then and derived great wealth from them until 1848, so says the historians. 
At that time, the Pope, along with the rulers of most of the other divided ter- uh, most of the other divided territories of Italy, was forced to grant his rebellious subjects a constitution. In other words, they rebelled against his temporal power. They decided, we will no longer have you king over us. And they elected their own leader and vested all temporal power in him and then wrote a constitution to guarantee their rights so the Pope couldn't trample on their rights anymore. Just exactly like the United States did. And just like the formation of the United States, this thing that the Italians did in throwing off the temporal power of the Pope, electing their own government, writing their own constitution, was viewed by the Pope as treason. Not against the Pope, but against the throne of Almighty God. The chair of Peter, upon which the Pope sits. But he was forced by the people to grant his subjects a constitution. In September of 1860, over his raging protests, Antichrist Pius IX lost all the papal states to the new, finally united kingdom of Italy, which left him, at the time, at the time of the First Vatican Council in 1870, <clears throat> still in control of Rome and its surroundings. Antichrist just won't give up. He says the point is that exactly as John foresaw in his vision, we're talking about John the Revelator, exactly as John the Revelator foresaw in his vision, a spiritual entity that claimed a special relationship with Christ and with God became identified with a city that was built on seven hills. That woman, described in Revelation chapter 17, committed spiritual fornication with earthly earthly rulers, the kings of the earth, and eventually reigned over them all, just as he does today. The Roman Catholic Church has been continuously identified with that city. This quote, the, excuse me, as, quote, the most definitive Catholic encyclopedia written since Vatican Council II declares this. Listen to this. Hence, one understands the central place of Rome in the life of the Roman Catholic Church today and the significance of the title Roman Catholic Church. The church that is universal, yet focused upon the ministry of the Bishop of Rome. Remember, Rome equals Vatican. Since the founding of the Roman Catholic Church there by St. Peter, Rome has been the center of all Christendom. Unquote. Did you know that Rome is the center of all Christendom? You would say Christ is the center of all Christendom, right? The real King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Uh Uh-uh, not so. Not in the world today, not in the Christian world today, whether Catholic or Protestant. Rome is the center of all Christendom today, just as it was in the old world order. Now, under the subtitle, Wealth from Ill-Gotten Gain, which the Bible calls Filthy Lucre, More identification that leaves us absolutely no doubt as to who Antichrist is. God being just as careful to identify Antichrist as he was to identify his own son. He says the incredible wealth of this woman, the Roman Catholic Church, caught John's attention next. She was dressed in, quote, purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Unquote. You see, Christianity today will tell you, you 
aren't smart enough to figure out who she, who this, who the Bible is talking about here. They'll tell you all, oh, don't waste your time reading the book of Revelation, and particularly Revelation chapter 17, because you just, you just can't understand it. And besides that, it leads to div- division and controversy within the quote unquote body of Christ. But listen to what Dave Hunt says. The colors of purple and scarlet once again identify the woman with both pagan and Christian Rome. These were the colors of the Roman Caesars with which the soldiers mockingly robed Christ as quote-unquote king. See Matthew chapter 27, verse 28, and John chapter 19, verse 2 and 5. These colors the Vatican has taken to itself. The cardinals and the, and the bishops wear scarlet and purple, respectively. I mean, it's a dead ringer. A child could understand it, yet all of Christendom is confused. Tell me why. Tell me why. They are so confused. They say they know who the Messiah is. <clears throat> See right here the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Recorded in the Bible thousands of years before Jesus even uttered the words. We know this is our Messiah. The Bible proves it. History proves it. Bible prophecy proves it. We understand these prophecies. We see their fulfillment in Jesus Christ, but we're completely oblivious about the Antichrist. Why? Purple and scarlet were the colors of the Roman Caesars with which the soldiers mockingly robed Jesus Christ as king, which the Vatican took to itself. You know, they put the scarlet and the purple on Jesus to mock him. That's what's taught, but I believe Satan was trying to mark Jesus as the Antichrist. Satan was literally trying to mark to mark Jesus as what he is, mockingly robing him with the colors worn by the priests and the bishops and the popes and the cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church. The woman's colors are literally still the colors of the Catholic clergy. And we'll prove it from the Catholic Encyclopedia when we get back from the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. All right, welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. We're going to go right to the Catholic Encyclopedia. The authority of the Roman Catholic Church, the Catholic Encyclopedia, everything written in it is written by Rome, approved by Rome given authority by Rome. And in the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia, we quote, under the title Kappa Magna, C-A-P-P-A-M-A-G-N-A, the Kappa Magna. A Kappa Magna is a cloak with a long train and a hooded shoulder cape. It was purple wool for bishops, purple wool for bishops, For cardinals, it was scarlet watered silk. No, not red watered silk. Scarlet watered silk. These are the words approved by the Roman Catholic Church in their own encyclopedia. Purple and scarlet. Just like God wrote it in the scripture. Prophecy being fulfilled right before your very eyes and verified in the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia. See, she's not ashamed of her role of Antichrist. She doesn't even try to cloak it. Purple wool was worn by the bishops, and the cardinals wore scarlet watered silk kappa magnus, and rose watered silk for Gaudet and Latter Sundays, and for the Pope, it was red velvet for Christmas matins, red serge on other times. 
So you can see the Pope and the, his priests are decked in scarlet and purple. Right out of the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia. And you say God left us in doubt who Antichrist is? That it's some sort of secret? <clears throat> that we can't read his Bible and identify positively who the man of sin is? God did not leave his people at risk of being deceived. So who has deceived us? Again, in the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia, it tells us what a cassock is. It's also called a soutane, or a soutane, S-O-U-T-A-N-E, but we're talking about the cassocks. He says it's a close, the, the encyclopedia says, the close-fitting ankle-length robe worn by Catholic clergy as their official garb. The color for the bishops and other prelates is purple. For cardinals, scarlet. Unquote. Now, what about the golden cup? Are we to be doubtful about that, too? Quote, the golden cup or chalice in her hand, unquote, again identifies the woman with the Roman Catholic Church. Broderick's edition of the Catholic Encyclopedia, this is Catholic Encyclopedia, declares of the chalice, quote, it is the most important of the sacred vessels. It may be of gold or silver, and if the latter, then the inside must be surfaced with pure gold. Unquote. Straight from the Roman Catholic Church. Straight from their own encyclopedia. The Roman Catholic Church possesses many thousands of solid gold chalices kept in its churches around the world. Even the blood-stained cross of Jesus Christ has been turned to gold and studded with gems in reflection of Rome's great wealth. Again, the Roman Catholic Church Encyclopedia says, quote, The pectoral cross, which you see sus suspended from the necks of every Roman Catholic priest, that big, heavy gold chain, and at the base of it is a crucifix with all kinds of, 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 of studded diamonds and gems of inestimable value. Golden crosses worn about mid-torso. You, you'll notice it any time you see a Roman Catholic bishop or a pope or a cardinal. They all wear them. It's called the pectoral cross. It is suspended by a chain around the neck and worn over the breast of abbots, bishops, archbishops, cardinals, and the pope as well. Should be made of gold and decorated with gems, unquote. That's from the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia, okay? That's not the Protestant Encyclopedia, by the way. That's the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia. Look... <clears throat> When a criminal comes to court and confesses his sin, do you question it? The Roman Catholic Encyclopedia verifies who's spoken of in Revelation chapter 17. The criminal is confessing in its own encyclopedia. Rome has practiced evil to gather her incalculable wealth for, quote, the golden cup, unquote, is filled with, quote, abominations and filthiness, unquote. Much of the wealth of the Roman Catholic Church was acquired through the confiscation, that's just a fancy word to describe theft, stealing, confiscation of the property of the pitiful victims of the Inquisitions. Who were the pitiful victims of the Inquisitions? Well, it was both Catholics and Protestants, and especially those Catholics and Protestants who had land, houses, children, 
gold, silver, artwork, animals, you name it. Rome stole it all, or rather confiscated it all. Even the dead were exhumed to face trial, and property was taken from their heirs by the Roman Catholic Church. You see, Rome has a law. If you're hauled into the Inquisition, you're found guilty, which everybody was found guilty. Rome got to confiscate the property of the heretic. Once determined guilty of heresy, you had no right to property. And the Inquisition took a cut, and the rest went to the church. She's decked in gold, silver, and precious stones and pearls. All ill-gotten gains, filthy lucre by theft. One historian writes, quote, The punishments of the Inquisition did not cease when the victim was burned to ashes or immured for life in the Inquisition dungeons. His relatives were reduced to beggary by the law that all his possessions were forfeited. The system offered unlimited opportunities for loot. This source of gain largely accounts for the revolting practice of what has been called corpse trials. That the practice of confiscating the property of condemned heretics was productive of many acts of extortion, rapacity, and corruption will be doubted by no one who has any knowledge, either of human nature or of the historical documents. No man was safe whose wealth might arouse cupidity or whose independence might provoke revenge. If you were a wealthy man during the old world order, you had to kowtow to the papacy, hook, line, and sinker. Because if you could even be remotely accused of heresy, you could lose it all. And the church would take it all and think she was doing God's service. You think God would leave his people in doubt about who would oppress them, who would corrupt their faith, who would eventually persecute and kill them and steal their property and claim at the same time to be Christ's vicegerent in the world? How treacherous would be God if that were true? I think we need to stop insulting the Savior, the God who bought us with his own blood. Stop defaming him. Stop discrediting him by suggesting that he would be so treacherous with the people that he bought with his blood. Let there not be one human being within the sound of my voice ever come to doubt ever again who the Antichrist is. He's not a single individual in the future. I don't care what you've been taught. I don't care how they've twisted the scriptures. You've got no excuse. The Bible and history make there no room for wiggling. Most of Rome's wealth has been acquired through the sale of salvation. Yeah, salvation for sale in the Roman Catholic Church, for sale to the highest bidder. Untold billions, that's with a B. Untold billions of dollars have been paid to the Roman Catholic Church by those who thought they were purchasing heaven on the installment plan for themselves and their loved ones, even those who have died. The practice continues to this day. Did you know that Pope Benedict XVI, before he <coughs> retired, reinstituted indulgences and dispensations? 
That's right. You can buy your way out of purgatory. You can buy, you can pay for your sins, both past, present, and future. All it takes is a little gold coin, some Federal Reserve notes. You can go to heaven if you've got enough money. The practice continues to this day blatantly where Catholicism is in control, like in Central and South America, <clears throat> where the people are destitute. Blatantly, where Catholicism is control, less obviously here in the United States. Why? Why less obviously here in the United States? Because the Roman Catholic Church in America is unique in all the Catholic world. They live among, well, people who read their Bibles, people who have still just a little inkling of morality left. That if Rome began to openly auction indulgences on the courthouse square, downtown, somebody might or might object. Might object. That's why they're not sold openly in this country, but they are everywhere else in the world. Every, especially every Roman Catholic country. Salvation to the highest bidder. That's why she's decked in gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls. She's got it all. Selling the souls of men. Buying and selling the souls of men. Buying and selling salvation on the open market. He says no greater deception or abomination could be perpetrated. When, when Cardinal Cajetan, 16th century Dominican scholar, complained about the sale of dispensations and indulgences, the Roman Catholic Church hierarchy was indignant and accused him of wanting, and accused him of wanting, quote, to turn Rome into an uninhabited desert, to reduce the papacy to impotence, to deprive the Pope of the pecuniary, that is the monetary resources, indispensable for the discharge of his office, unquote. You protest against the sale of salvation in the Roman Catholic Church, you will be accused of putting the papacy in the poorhouse, stripping him of his power, making him incapacitated so that he cannot perform his diabolical office. Worse than that, you'll be called a heretic. And at that point, you have no rights. You know what this tells me? The papacy cannot perform his office without gold, money. I think we ought to starve him out. I think we ought to confront our politicians in Washington, D.C. Not one more penny to Rome. You abolish the Federal Reserve Bank. You issue our own currency. And not one more red cent goes to Rome. And if anybody opposes that, he'd kick them out of government. Protestant, Catholic alike. The Federal Reserve Bank is just a Vatican bank. Everybody wants to talk about the Rothschilds, but nobody will tell you the Rothschilds are the, the Pope's bankers. They want you to believe it's a Jewish conspiracy for pity's sake. The Jesuits control the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds learned their banking trade at the Lyceum Le Grand in France, a Jesuit university. They've been cultivated. Their entire lineage is cultivated to be the Pope's bankers. And it was Roman Catholics, Papists in our government, that passed the Federal Reserve Act illegally at midnight on Christmas morning. It wasn't a Jewish conspiracy. It was a Vatican conspiracy. See, the Bible doesn't talk about a Jewish conspiracy, but it does talk about a Roman conspiracy. You listen to what you call a truth teller on the mainstream media or the alternative media like Alex Jones, he wouldn't say Pope if he had a mouth full of it. He calls himself a Christian, but he's dubious about the Antichrist. Who is the Antichrist? Well, I don't know. Could be Barack Obama for all I know. What asininity 
not to be excused in this enlightened age. Not to be excused when there's a Bible on every coffee table in this country. We can fix this problem. We can kick Antichrist out of our country and put Jesus back where he belongs. Do we have the courage? We can take all the papist talk show hosts and put them in the soup line. No more soothing words. I want the truth. The truth can't be bought. It ain't for sale. You tell it for free. And if you don't have the courage to tell it, hit the road. We need to stand up for Christ. And we need to stand up against Antichrist, the Pope of Rome. We've got no excuse. The heavens declare the glory of God, not the Pope. So why are we all submitted by force to Roman Catholic canon law when all the preachers and the churches in this country say God's law is dead? Somebody kick me. It shouldn't be necessary to scream these truths. It shouldn't be necessary to raise my voice. God's people ought to just do what comes naturally. Praise Christ and revile His Antichrist on every street corner, in every courtroom, in every county seat, in every city council meeting, in every school board meeting. We can defeat this Roman horde if we will just pull up our pants and quit believing every popish lie that comes down the pike. We can hold this government to account. Just simply declare the truth everywhere we go. Be walking billboards for Christ and against Antichrist. You know, we know who Jesus is. No doubt about it. God left no room for error about who Jesus was and is. And he left us equally no room for doubt about who Antichrist is. And the only reason we're slaves to Antichrist today is because we just can't find the courage to offend somebody. No wonder call, the Bible calls Jesus a rock of offense. I'm telling you one thing. He's not going to be afraid to offend Antichrist and all who bow down and worship him. We've got no excuse. He says, in addition to such perversions of the gospel, which have led hundreds of millions astray, There are the further abominations of corruption in the banking practices, laundering of drug money, trading in counterfeit securities, and dealings with the mafia fully documented in police and court records, which the Vatican and her representatives around the world have long employed. Nino Lobello, former Business Week correspondent in Rome and Rome Bureau Chief of the New York Journal of Commerce, writes that the Vatican is so closely allied with the Mafia in Italy that, quote, many people believe that Sicily is nothing more than a Vatican holding, unquote. Her cup is full of the abominations of the filthiness of her fornication. And everybody in this country is in doubt about who it's talking about. The Roman Catholic Church is by far the wealthiest institution on earth. Yes, one hears from Roman Catholic Catholic Church periodic pleas for money. Persuasive appeals claiming that the Vatican cannot maintain itself on its limited budget and needs monetary assistance. Such pleas are unconscionable ploys. The value of innumerable sculptures by which masters such as Michelangelo made, paintings by the world's greatest artists, the countless other art treasures and ancient documents which Rome possesses, not only at the Vatican but in all her cathedrals around the world, is beyond calculation. At the World Synod of Bishops in Rome, England's Cardinal Heenan proposed that the church sell some of its superfluous treasures and give the proceeds to the poor. His suggestion, as you might well be well uh, uh, anticipate, was not well received. Now, she loves her gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, and she's not going to give any of them away. Starve if you might. 
Christ and his disciples lived in poverty. He told his followers not to lay up treasure on this earth, but in heaven. The Roman Catholic Church has disobeyed that command and has accumulated a plethora of riches without equal, of which the Roman pontiff is the supreme administrator and steward, unquote. There's no church, no city, which is a spiritual entity, no religious institution, past or present, or even comes close to the possession of wealth of the Roman Catholic Church. God left us no room for doubt who the Antichrist is. And if you're in doubt, then you may well be in doubt about who Jesus is. Because God does not deal treacherously with his people.